Good morning, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, and, well, other, um, if neither of those apply to you. I have here the IBM PC motherboard, and we have a close-up look at a card, board, and the ISA slot. ISA stands for Industry Standard Architecture. It was kind of a backronym. Um, it's a whole bunch of political business stuff and has to do with you know, licensing infringement and stuff like that way back in the day. Maybe not licensing infringement, but copyright infringement. IBM called it one thing specifically and everybody else wanted to use another name. To continue, we have this connector here and there's a whole bunch of little copper contacts that make contact with the PC board. And uh, that's how we get signals and the power from this card to the motherboard. See all these little squiggly lines down in there, those copper traces? They run all over the place. They come straight up to the processor, some of them. They come to the IRQ and DM interrupt request controllers, and DMA controllers, and peripheral controllers, timers, and you get clock signals going in there. This thing has lines going all over the board because it has to communicate with just about everything. Um, and it's essentially the same thing with a modern PC. You have your PCI Express bus, and it talks to the North Bridge, or is it the South Bridge? It's one of those bridges. And that bridge is what talks to everything else. So there's just an extra layer in the more modern stuff. But it's essentially the same thing. And... Uh, this is much simpler so we can get a better look at a lower level at what things are and what things do. So here we have the actual card. We have a 31 pin on this side and a 01 pin on this side. Maybe it's for side A and side B. This side, let's see, it's good close-up view, B01 and B31, right next to the connector. And let's take a close look. Same thing here. We have A01 and uh, A31 over here. So I'm assuming it's side A and side B. Maybe it's A for address and B for bold. <coughs> so we'll, we'll take it from there. So like I was saying, A is for the address side. We have on the A31 pin, address is zero. And uh, over here somewhere we have uh, a 19 pin, I'm guessing somewhere in this range. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, a 12 pin, which will be address 19. Uh, so address 0 to 19, that's 20 pins, it's 20 pin addressing. And uh, then we have a couple of other pins for data ready or IO ready and address enable and a couple of very simple signaling pins. And then basically the rest of these pins are for data. 8-bit data, so you have 8 data pins. So each side has basically, you know, 31 pins. If we look at the other side, the B side, or the uh, <coughs> uh, pin side, uh, these have power and ground. And there's also some clock signals and the IRQ signals and acknowledgement, ground, and power. These are kind of interesting because these actually have a split voltage system in them. You have a positive 5 volts, you have a negative 5 volts, you have a ground, and then you have a negative 12 volts and a positive 12 volts. I'm not entirely sure which pins are which because there's a whole lot of them. They don't really have any logical sense as far as I'm concerned as to which pin is what. Um, yes, it's good stuff. And that's basically how modern uh, PCI Express is set up too. You have a whole bunch of differential pairs for signals. Um, and I'll explain some differential signaling when I get my whiteboard in. Um, yeah, so we'll get into that later. But 
the other side of the PCI Express basically has all of your power and some interrupt stuff. So, there's that. But, let's look at uh, these capacitors. We have all these capacitors over here, and uh, there's some over here. And they're just kind of sprinkled all over the board like salt and pepper. Let's take a kind of a close-up look at uh, one of those caps. And those are tantalum caps. We don't like to see too much voltage on those. If you overvolt those things, they tend to go poof and uh, have small fires or explosions. Lots of fun. Man, I love how circuit boards look. And aren't they just beautiful? And then you see these these cans over here. Oops, focusing on my finger. Ooh, there's a crystal oscillator package, 16 megahertz, which I'm assuming is divided down somewhere here into a more usable frequency. Come on, come on, autofocus. There we go. Um, you know, because the whole system runs at 4.77, so they got to do some magic to get that down to the right clock. Um, so I'm assuming they use some of these to do some division using some basic counters and such like that. If anybody has any information on these three oddball IBM packages, please let me know. I would appreciate it greatly. Hopefully that uh, high-res video, press pause, write those down, go hunt them down for me. I've spent about three hours googling those and I was completely unable to get anything good on them. But I was able to prize up one of these little packages. So let's uh, take a quick peek at that. Looks like, come on autofocus, do your job. It looks like, you see that little red stuff in there? It looks like they use some silicone to kind of gunk it on there, give it a good seal. So this thing's probably shot now. But let's go ahead and look at that little package. Ooh, let's see how close I can get with autofocus before it just completely loses it. Yep, it completely lost it. But look at that. Isn't that awesome? That is amazing little bit of uh, packaging there. That looks like a couple of chips on a ceramic substrate. Maybe that's a de local decoupling cap. Uh, that very well could be. Um, let's go ahead and look at the back. They got some weird packaging pinouts. Uh, there's a diamond inside of all these other pins, and they're labeled A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And uh, next one over has the uh, same thing, but it's got what looks like an extra one. That might just be a Via. And this one has another square pin out with uh, some extra pins in the corner. That's, uh, that's pretty interesting stuff, but man, and doesn't that look neat? I love technology, even antique technology. It's so beautiful. Anyway, so yes. Oh, decoupling caps. I was going to explain decoupling caps. I should totally get in to some decoupling caps. Yes, decoupling caps. That's what I was talking about. Okay, so we have all these capacitors sprinkled all over the place, like a little bit of salt and pepper. Uh, all those kind of orangish brown uh, two liter packages. Those are, uh, well, decoupling caps. And for the five billionth time, let's say again, decoupling caps. Anyways, those are uh, typically used and sprinkled very uh, liberally all over many boards of various different types, both uh, surface mount and through hole like these guys. Typically they're tantalum or ceramic style. Um, and they're used to smooth out the power right at the chip's pins. Um, it looks like, you know, here's these larger ones that are next to these big fat power rails, and then you got these littler ones right next to the pins. And they do that because when these chips start drawing large amounts of current, comparatively, you're so far away from the power source, the impedance of the lines and traces can kind of cause your voltage to sag a little bit. Um, yeah, that's basically what it boils down to. And those capacitors give you a little bit of surge capability. Or if uh, you, your voltage goes high when something stops using power, you get a, a quick snap and voltage goes up. Well, that kind of keeps it low so you don't cook your chips. 
vice versa. When your line drops low, it kind of stores a little bit of power and feeds the chip until you get more current coming through the lines. I'm horrible at explaining this stuff. I will have to get a whiteboard and really do some diagrams and show you what I mean. There's a bunch of math that explains it very well and hopefully that'll do the ticket. Now, yeah, I don't know why I said now. Well, I think we're pretty much done. So, why don't you all have a wonderful weekend or week or morning, afternoon, lunchtime. I don't know, whatever it is for you. Have a good night.